Good evening, sports fans, and welcome to a brand new semester of Sports Zone. We're starting things off strong with a recap of the Mean Green football team visiting the SMU Mustangs in Dallas. And here to help me out with that are my analysts, Anthony George and Good. Jeremiah Russo. Hey, hey. How are y'all doing, gentlemen? Good. Hey, hey. Um, well, not great uh, after last Saturday's game. It uh, did not look great. Could be better. Well, since you volunteered so eagerly with that, George, why don't you tell me about the game itself? Um, I mean, it looked close in the first half, up six nothing. But um, I mean, as soon as that score in the late in the late first half, uh, where SMU scored, I mean, it, it was pretty much over from there. You couldn't figure out anything on defensive afterwards. Reuter threw two interceptions for the second week in a row. He did not look good. We couldn't get the run game going. The offensive line did not block well. Torrey only had 16 carries for 71 yards instead of last week, where he had 244 yards and three touchdowns. The only guy that really looked good on offense. Um, was Roderick Burns for the second week in a row with 12 receptions and 141 yards. Um, was really the only guy that Reuter was coming close to going to. But, I mean, just overall, the game did not look good for either side, at, um, especially in the second half. Absolutely. Yeah, it was a bit of a rough one out for our boys there. Uh, I think going into hostile territory for the first time with fans was actually a pretty big oh, yeah. factor going into it. And uh, we heard a little bit about the offense from George. Jeremiah, why don't you tell me about the defense? Yeah, side I the mean, ball? the defense, honestly, they had a pretty solid game. You know, coming into outside territory, you know, you're in foreign land. It's going to be hard. But you know what? They did amazing. I think, you know, first half only giving up a touchdown. That's pretty good. Even in the first quarter, didn't even give up, give up anything. Um, story for the defense, honestly, the Davis twins again. KD and Tyreek, they were unstoppable. Tyreek had five touchdowns, or touchdowns, I'm sorry, five tackles. Wrong side, but that's all right. And then KD had six tackles on that side. So, yeah, um, again, with the two turnovers or four turnovers around, two fumbles, recoveries, and with two interceptions, I think the defense had a solid game. And then I just think SMU, you know, they just figured it out at the second half. Um, Coach figured it out, and then, you know, they beat us to it, unfortunately. So that's what the score was. Absolutely. I do think there's positives to look forward to there. You touched on it a little bit with the takeaways. They got eight takeaways. All of last season, they had nine. Mm -hmm. So they're already making strides in that department. But UNT, now one and one on the season, heading into conference play. Seth Luttrell, head coach, now in his sixth season with UNT. And you got to start wondering, George, is he on the hot seat? Absolutely, I think he is. I mean... You come in, you start, you start, you, you know, your career off well. You have Mason Rush, who looked really good through his first three seasons. Um, uh, I mean, he looked like he was going to be a, a good, a, you know, an NFL ability quarterback. Um, you went nine and three. You were one of the front runners in the, in, in the American Conference. And then it all just shot down from there. Rush's senior season was an absolute bust. He looked terrible. The offense looked terrible. And then... Last year, you couldn't find a quarterback, even with a, a fantastic receiver in Jalen Darden, who was a fourth-round pick to the Buccaneers. And then you just straight up, this year, Jace Reuter looks terrible. He's staring down his receivers. He can't pick up coverages real well. He has two touchdowns and four interceptions, and that includes a win, whereas running back went off for 250 yards. They're not using the play action well enough because everybody knows that the UNT is going to run the ball because they can't seem to figure out to pass the ball. Um, especially near the re in the red zone where they haven't scored all that many points, especially in this game where they couldn't figure out any conversions whatsoever. Um, and so they shut down the run. They're not using enough play action. And Reuters just, you know, sitting there staring at his receivers. And that is partly the fault of Seth Luttrell. He, he is an offensive-minded coach, an offensive-minded guy from North Carolina, um, you know, when he, where he was the you know, uh, assistant head coach on the offensive side. Um, but, uh, you know, former Oklahoma running back, uh, but he's not, he can't seem to figure out anything on offense. He, you know, uh, his scheme looks bad. Um, the offensive line looks bad. Your quarterback, which is, you know, one, the, your main job as a, you know, a head coach is to, you know, get with your quarterback coach, get your offensive coordinator, but create the scheme for your quarterback to be successful. And he has not whatsoever. It looks bad. And I think he's absolutely on the hot seat, especially that they don't even have to fire him. His contract just uh, is up and they can just let him go. A scathing analysis to say the least. Oh yeah. I, would think. I mean, kind of going a little bit further into that, you know, he is on that final year and his record is right now at 532-32. So in the back of the mind, I say, you know what? He is on the hot seat, but I don't think it's such a big concern right now because you still have the rest of the season to go and anything can happen. So, you know, we start off 1-1, you know, you don't know what we do. 
And so I feel like maybe in the back of the mind, you know, keep a list. But yes, I feel like maybe Seth Luttrell, maybe it's his style, like he was kind of touching on very offensively. He's also calling the plays for UNT. So I know like the Cowboys and the Bears, Matt Nagy, and I know Jason Garrett, they used to call the plays. And then they finally were like, okay, let's get a coordinator to actually, you know, take a side from that job. Maybe that's what UNT needs to do. Maybe, you know, that's going to turn the Jets. And then you don't know, maybe we got a 10-win season coming up. So... That's just kind of my take. I say yes, but at the end, you know, time's only going to tell for us. Sure. He, so it sounds like he's going to have a tough time with the job coming up here. So then I got to ask, if it is so dark and bleak, gentlemen, very quickly, what kind of record does he need in the Conference USA this year to keep his job? I say he needs a winning record at least just to prove himself like, hey, I'm not a losing coach, you know. It's got to be seven or five, eight and four. Mm-hmm. Uh, I feel I like it has to be a successful season against opponents that are, you know, not as good as you. Does he have to win conference title, or is it just no, he has to be a winning coach? I think he just coach. has to compete for the conference title. Okay. He doesn't compete, have to win it, but compete. I say compete, maybe get a bowl appearance. We haven't had those. And if we can, get a bowl win. I think a bowl win would be well, no, great that would, wonders that would for him, too. solidify his job. So. Exactly. All but. right. Well, it's going to be an interesting game coming up. Anybody got real quick thoughts against UAB, how they look? UAB, they, they're facing up Georgia. They did not look strong at all. Georgia ran over them, definitely. Yeah, it, 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 is it, is Georgia, it is Georgia, but still. So I don't think it's it's Georgia. Gonna be not, not that's well, not exactly maybe with that fair. momentum, we kind of take over UAB right. with that. Well, we'll have a detailed preview with uh, on our Thursday show, but coming up next, we have the Cowboys recap versus the Bucks. Welcome back to Sports Zone. The Dallas Cowboys opened the NFL season on the national stage Thursday night against the Buccaneers, ended up dropping the game in a heartbreaking fashion. And here to tell me all about it are my analysts, Mason Shepard and Sebastian Nava. Gentlemen, how are we feeling? Feeling pretty good. good. Thank you. I would be a lot better if the Cowboys could manage to win an opening night game. But (laughs) I'll let you all tell me about it. Mason, I'm going to come to you. Tell me all about the game. Well, I personally feel like... Dallas played a lot better than a lot of people expected them to. And I feel like when you look at how the game was supposed to go in a lot of fans' minds, Dallas hanging on with the former Super Bowl champions to the end of the wire shows that Dallas has improved, at least on the offensive side of the ball. So I thought the game went pretty well. Sure. I mean, it was, uh, there are no moral victories in the NFL. You never like to take a loss. But I think there are some positives to look forward to. And I think the defense was one of them. Sebastian, do you agree? Uh, I, well, I agree that the, def- that the defense needs to work. You know, obviously, you know, we saw Anthony Brown, you know, didn't have the best of games. You know, he got pretty much wrecked by the other A.B., Antonio Brown, which, uh, you know, it just shows that the Cowboys will have a long way to go with their defense. You know, obviously, Micah Parsons didn't play a terrible game. Terrence Crawford was able to, I don't know, Demarcus Lawrence. I don't, <laughs> Demarcus Lawrence was able to, you know, put some, put some pressure on the offense. So, yeah. I still think it holding the returning Super Bowl champs to that level of play for mo- most of the game is a big deal and definitely something for them to build on. And gentlemen, it was Dak's first game in a little less than a year after his horrific injury back in 2020. What were your thoughts on his first game back, Mason? Oh, my thoughts were Dak is back. I was excited. I was happy. You know, Dak played well, made a few mistakes, but overall Dak was Dak was incredible. He went blow for blow for Tom with Tom Brady, and he was just I was I was proud to see him back on the field, and I'm just I'm glad Dak is back. He played great in my opinion. I think he had a solid performance as well. I'm not a hundred percent sold yet. His velocity was not quite there in that opening first few drives. You saw a couple of passes out to the flats for receivers and running backs that didn't nearly have that kind of zip on it that we were used to. Being and nitpicky now? We're gonna be nitpicky. I'm gonna be nitpicky. Oh, we're until, gonna be nitpicky. Oh, in the in, in the NFC East you do and don't have room for nitpicky, right? Yeah, exactly. Because it's going to be a tightly contested division, but not necessarily for the right reasons. Nope. Um, Now, while Dak is back, Tom Brady never left, Sebastian. (laughs) No, he really didn't. You know, obviously, I mean, obviously, you know, you look at the stat, you see the final scoreline, you see the two picks, but the two picks, if you really think about it, they weren't really his fault, were they? You know, because you saw, uh, you know, he threw it to his running back off the hands right there. Second one was a Hail Mary. You know, that's pretty much a 5% chance of it working out. So, you know, obviously, if you take that away, he's, he played a perfect game. He truly did. You know, he earned Pro Football Focus, named him Offensive Player of the Week. You know, so he, he earned the title. Of course they did. Mason's struggling with that one there. Yeah. Um, I got to be honest, guys. Looking at the Cowboys in their opening game on a national stage, 
I was overall impressed, but there's definite room for improvement. Mason, from the offensive side, what do you think they need to do better? Uh, really, from the offensive side, I think we got to keep working with that offensive line, really on a lot of the technique that I saw. And more so, I will say this, the lack of carries they gave Zeke was the biggest improvement. And I think if we keep going forward with that, I mean, we see what we can do with the former Super Bowl champions. We could do that with any team. And I just think that they need to keep avoid running the ball with Zeke and running him into the ground. And then more so just keep on focusing on throwing the football, getting Dak involved. And I think the offense will open up. I did think it was interesting that, uh, you know, usually the Cowboys for the past few years under Kellen Moore have decided that they're going to run Zeke no matter whether it's successful or not. And they thought it was very refreshing to see him more of in a uh, pass blocking scheme and having Tony Pollard be more of a receiving back. I think they do have the opportunity to make that work later with Zeke running more depending on the offensive front, but it definitely looked like their game plan was we cannot run on this Tampa Bay front four, so we're not even gonna try. Um, Sebastian, on defense, we talked a bit about Micah Parsons having a tough time. Um, what is their biggest room for improvement? Uh, like I said earlier, the secondary, I feel, you know, needs, needs a lot of uh, improvement, especially, you know, you, you, look at, you look at all the space, you know, Tom Brady had to throw all day. So, of course, you need to tighten up those windows, you know, make it harder, you know, get some more coverage sacks. You know, those help out a lot. So, yeah, if they had to pick one part of the defense to improve on, it would have to be the secondary. Again. <laughs> <laughs> it just never stops with the Cowboys secondary, unfortunately. Uh, we found out after the game that Lyle Collins will be out for five games minimum, suspended by the NFL. Uh, another lineman down for the Cowboys, and it seems to just be a perennial problem right now. Mason, is there any hope for a Cowboys line that just keeps getting injured, COVID list, et cetera? Oh, man. You know, it's hard to say. You know, it's like one step forward, three steps back. We play a great game, and then this happens. I think more, uh, I just, I, honestly, man, I have no idea. This is just, Dallas's offensive line is just such a letdown in the offseason, especially with injuries and then, scandals and then COVID it's just it never ends so I just hope that you know Dallas is able to be consistent with keeping their offensive linemen healthy and on the field this season and Sebastian uh Randy Gregory going on the COVID list after we get um Zach Williams off off the COVID list and then Michael Gallup going on IR pretty two big pieces for an offense and defense that could improve how is that going to affect us going forward well, it's obviously going to take away from, you know, the offensive, offensive end from Michael Gallup, but I'm not too worried, especially because you still have Mark Cooper and CeeDee Lamb out or out, you know, on the field for the Cowboys. And, yeah, you'll still be able to get pressure. Absolutely. Well, the Cowboys will get a chance to win back against the Chargers on Sunday. We'll have a preview for you on Thursday. But coming up next, we have week one overreactions. Okay, Dad. One, two, three. <laughs> Your hero needs you now, and AARP is here to help. Find the care guides you need at aarp.org slash caregiving. Welcome back to Sports Zone. We had a weird and wacky week one of NFL football, and to tell me all about it, are my analysts Parker Smith and Jose Moreno. Gentlemen, how are we today? Pretty good. How are you? I'm not too shabby. That was a crazy week um, full of games that I don't think anybody really expected to view. Parker, I'm going to come to you first. What game was your just craziest one? Definitely that Browns-Chiefs game. That was an unbelievable game from start to finish. The Browns were dominating early, and then we saw the Chiefs come back, as Patrick Mahomes always seems to do. And it was really just a spectacular finish and overall great game. Yeah, I, it is pretty clear after that that you cannot ever, ever count Patrick Mahomes out of a game if he has any time. Nope. The ball in his hands, he just does miraculous things. Magician. Even if he doesn't win in that Super Bowl game, the sideways He's throw, a was, he is a magician. Uh, Jose, what were your thoughts on your game? Uh, I picked the Broncos game this week. Now I know the Broncos don't play the most interesting style of football, but it was really surprising seeing Teddy Bridgewater play so well. But again, this is Teddy Bridgewater, so like that first, few, those first few games will play really well. 
Teddy? You're going to hate on Teddy? Like Listen, that? dude, he's the Derrick Rose of the NFL. I know, I get it. I love him. He's great. He, he had an awful miss happening to his career, but we, we got to admit it. T Teddy Bridgewater, you kind of just get him when you don't really have a real quarterback, and then you get a real one, and you're like, well, bye, Teddy. Go on to his next team. And the cycle continues. He's kind of just like a solid game manager. You know, he, yeah, he can get, he's like, he's like a passing quarterback. He just, not a passing quarterback. Like, you get what I'm saying? Like, you just use him for a little bit. He's a rental, you know, a mm -hmm. rental. Um, and everyone played great. Jerry Judy got injured. That sucks. That's, that was really sad. Um, but KJ Hamler and Colin Sutton are still very talented and they just need some more touches and they need to pick up the slack that will be, you know, left behind by Judy. But he's only gonna be gone for maybe three, four weeks because, uh, you know, the injury's not as bad as they thought it was gonna be. So pray for Judy. Of course, I will pay for him. He's a great wide receiver. He's also on my fantasy team, so. That's important, yeah. He would be yeah. good. My personal game was the Packers versus the Saints. Gentlemen, I don't know if we have ever or will ever see again Aaron Rodgers play a game as terrible as that. 15 for 28, 133 yards, and two picks with no touchdowns. A 13.4 quarterback rating. I heard. 13.4. I heard his passer rating would have been better if he threw the ball into the dirt every single single game. <laughs> That doesn't surprise me at all. Um, so we've had a week of games now, gentlemen. And rational thought aside, I just want your craziest, craziest thoughts coming out of week one. Parker, go. I believe that Tyreek Hill will be the NFL's first 2,000-yard wide receiver this year. We've got an extra game. He's, he, has to get, he started off with 197 yards in his week one game, which is fantastic. And... With the new and improved offensive line, Mahomes is going to have even more time to air the ball out deep. We saw it on that 75-yard touchdown pass. He just looked down there and said, hey, Tyreek's down there somewhere, and he chucked it up. And it was a fantastic play, and there's going to be a lot more of that to come this season. I feel like that's 75% of Tyreek Hill's catches. Just about, just, yep. Yeah, oh, that looks like Tyreek down there. Can't really tell. Now, do you think uh, that it's going to be a little asterisk mark next to that record um, since they're getting an extra game this season? Does that actually count, or do you think there's going to be receivers that are going to say that hey, that doesn't count? See it as you wish. No receiver's ever done it before, and if he does that, it's, it's going down in the record books forever. So That's fair. Jose, wacky. Let's okay. see it. Okay, uh, Trevor Lawrence will just be mediocre for his entire career. Oh! Mediocre. Now listen. Mediocre? He played the most mediocre game of football for his debut, and I think that's... Three touchdowns. Three interceptions. 300 yards. Was Jameis Winston Did mediocre? He's the, he's the and touchdown and to interception king. Listen, <laughs> Jameis Winston got LASIK surgery, and now he's playing great, you know? Now he's playing actual football. He's not playing like me out there. Trevor Lawrence is, is, by many, to be considered the greatest NFL prospect of all time, right behind Andrew Luck. Um, I just don't see it in him. I was not, I'm, not sur I'm not like surprised by him. He, he's playing just really mediocre, and I'm expecting that from him because it is a Clemson quarterback. The only good other Clemson quarterback is Deshaun Watson, and we can't even mention his name anymore. Um, on top of that, he's playing for the Jacksonville Jaguars, Urban Meyer, a system he just cannot really fit into on top of that. I just don't see him playing well. And, and I think he's going to struggle a lot this year because he's finally getting old. He's, he's leaving this amazing dynasty team, and he's entering the toilet bowl of all NFL teams in the Jacksonville Jaguars. <sighs> Sorry. Wow. So we have Tyreek Hill leading uh, 2,000 yards in a single 2, season. Yards, yep. And then we've got Trevor Lawrence just aiming for the dumpster. Swan diving is what you're saying. Not, not the dumpster, just like... The, like, he's going to be in the unemployment line a lot. After one game, of course. Not Why? after one that, game. That's after the point, though. <laughs> that's a safe space, gentlemen. After his preseason as well. He didn't play that one well in the preseason, from what I heard. He did play pretty well against the Cowboys. But he hasn't been that good. I mean, all the people from training camp have been saying he's awful. That's well, <laughs> So, I mean, I'm kind of nervous. I love Lawrence. I hope the best for him in his career. But, I mean, he's not playing to his ability. My prediction, personally, is that the NFC West is going to have all four teams in the playoffs. Cardinals played amazing. Uh, Rams, really good as well. Seahawks, Russell Wilson absolutely killed it. And the 49ers had a little bit of struggles there at the end, but they looked very good overall. And with the extended spot being added into the wild cards, yeah. there's really no reason why they can't dominate the entire package. They, I think, are the best division top to bottom, and it's really not even close in my opinion. I think I'd have to agree with you there. I, th I mean, I don't even know if that's an overreaction. I think that might just be a reaction. Yeah. Um, but... We'll see how it wraps up. Coming up next, we have our UNT players that we're keeping an eye on.
Welcome back to Sports Zone. Here at Sports Zone, we like to shine a spotlight on all of our UNT athletes, even those that may not get the spotlight of the Texas State Religion football. But here to talk about those athletes with me are my analysts, AJ Tellers and Sean Smith. Gentlemen, how are we feeling? Pretty good. Excited to talk about some uh, sports that don't get the attention they deserve. Excellent. Well, you seem really eager. So, AJ, why don't we start with you? Who's your player to watch? Yeah, so my, uh, my North Texas player to watch, uh, I'm going to go over to the soccer field. And Taylor Tufts, a sophomore midfielder, um, she has bounced back uh, in a big way since being a medical redshirt at the University of Oklahoma, transferred here. And, and in year two with the Mean Green, she has started out of the gate in a big way, led the country in assists through the first couple of games, still top six as we speak in that category while pacing North Texas. And she's the top shot getter in for, uh, for the Mean Green, also leading them in points in terms of uh, scoring in terms of points and ha having the privilege to cover this soccer team. Uh, one, one of their strengths is attacking through the midfield. And as far as winning possession, playing key balls up front, Taylor Tufts has been a big part of that. And for a program that's looking for their eighth uh, NCAA tournament and uh, their uh, fifth Conference USA title, she's going to have to be and look for uh, Taylor Tufts to be a big part contributing going forward. Yeah, they start, I uh, believe, tonight against Florida Atlantic Conference USA yes, play. So she's looking to be a big part of that game as well? Yeah, she, she's going to have to be a big cog. They're starting to get some healthy pieces back, but definitely Taylor Tufts, production-wise, she's been the cog that's uh, led this team go. Absolutely. Well, I like a little bit of soccer, a little bit of a mix-up there from football and basketball that gets all the attention. Sean, what's your thoughts? Tell you one thing, we are in football season right now, but this UNT basketball team, I'm excited for the future. Uh, losing three starters from last season, it doesn't always put programs in a great place, but we have so much talent on this roster. I think they're, they're going places. A lot of young guys are ready to step up. One player that really excites me is Ruben Jones, six foot five point guard out of Houston, Texas. He's a big lefty. I'll tell you, he's six five, but the way he navigates screens, penetrates the defense, finds gaps, you'd think he's five foot six. He's, uh, he still has that height and explosiveness to finish at the rim, though. He shot over 40% from three last season. Uh, you know, losing Javion Hamlet, he went to play pro in Israel. That's going to leave a big hole for us. Uh, a lot of minutes to step up and fill, and I think he's ready for it. Absolutely. Now, you, is he somebody that's going to lead UNT back to the big dance this year? He might not lead the team in scoring this season. Uh, it's his sophomore year. Uh, he's coming off a uh, all-conference all USA first-team freshman. But in years to come, I think uh, he has all-conference potential. Another March run is, uh, Definitely I think possible. that's something we can see in the future. Excellent. Well, basketball, second. I think it's the second most popular sport here. Being football, basketball, pretty big. I am going to go with a deep dive into the volleyball team. And my pick is going to be senior Sarah Hausler, six foot one, middle blocker from Alito, Texas. She leads the team in blocks and is second on the team in kills, which is very impressive for a mid blocker. Um, Coach Palaleo likes to say you don't win mid uh, games with a mid blocker alone, but there's no question that in terms of defense, she's kind of the linchpin of this team going forward, and she's going to be a big part of every single game they have. When I was re viewing recaps of games, she was mentioned by name in every single recap. She gets nothing but stats, and she's going to be a big part of the UNT volleyball team going forward. Uh, I want to come back to you a little bit, AJ. On the soccer field, how do you think the UNT team in general is going to shape up? So they need to get healthy, number one. Their only loss of the season came against Baylor, and they were banged up. They were missing three key starters. And I, I mentioned Taylor Tuff. The strength of this team is the midfield, and boy, are they deep when they get healthy. Now, we, we saw last year Rice was the number one team in Conference USA, won the regular season title, won it outright. You mentioned we're getting into conference play. This team has the ability to run the table in conference play going forward, but there's one game circled on the calendar at home in Denton, regular season finale against Rice, ranked team, number one conference USA team a year ago. That is the game that North Texas, if they are able to hold serve, be in contention to win the conference, that game against Rice, end of the season, look out. Love it. Oh, man, I love a good home game to finish off the season against a ranked opponent. Get everybody out there. Love to see all the fans back now that we can have them there. I think that does make a big difference. And, you know, we urge people to be safe, but we do want people to be a part of that experience. And, Sean, speaking of being a part of that experience, if it's not Reuben Jones, who should the fans be cheering instead of J.B. on Hamlet? Well, the leading scorer from the starting unit last season is Thomas Bell. He's a six foot six wing. He's going to be asked to play a big role for us this season. Uh, he's been primarily defense first past few seasons, but uh, he's going to have to be asked to step up, take on more of that scoring role this year. So, Yeah, I, we do wish all the best for Javion Hamlet as well. An absolutely great player. Um, 
great leader for the team, and we really hope that he does have a good time over in Israel. And I personally enjoy doing these little looks that, you know, players, everybody knows, you know, uh, Reuter, the quarterback the, for UNT, everybody knows Katie Davis. But I do enjoy taking a look deeper into the sports that does get a whole lot of attention usually. Thank you so much for watching Sports Zone. We will be broadcasting 5.30 Tuesday and Thursday now on Frontier 46 and Charter 192. We'll see you all on Thursday. Have a great night.